Hey guys, we are Sean and Christy. This is Long Long Honeymoon, and in this video, we're going to talk about where to camp in the year of our Lord, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about how we find campsites. Yes. So this video will be great for those of you who are relatively new to RV camping, and also all of you old timers out there who want to stay abreast. Can I say abreast on YouTube? I think so. Of the latest changes and developments in the industry. First of all, let's think about where you can actually RV camp. Yeah, where like can you park your RV? The different types of campgrounds that exist for RV camping. So for simplicity, I've kind of divided it up into publicly owned land and privately owned land. Mm -hmm. We'll start out with privately owned land. And I'm thinking of, for example, RV parks are typically privately owned parks. And we're talking about places like Good Sam Club affiliated parks mm -hmm. and KOAs, RV resorts. Yeah. And just those little mom and pop campgrounds that you find here and there. A lot of those just may be individually owned pieces of land. People have carved them up into campsites. They put out 30 amp and 50 amp connections. Hopefully, you know, maybe there's hookups and sewer lines and good stuff like that. And there are a lot of really nice ones around the country. Yes, absolutely. Another option is privately owned land that you can overnight park on, harvest hosts, that's a membership club. And these types of places are really unique because they're usually not a campground at all. It's just a business of some sort that has a large parking lot that you can park in overnight. So a lot of times it's a winery or a brewery or a museum of some sort or a farm, those types of places. So again, privately owned land that you can spend the night on in your RV. Yeah, and Harvest Host is a club that you join. And I'll just point out, we are Harvest Host affiliates. If you're interested in learning more about Harvest Host, we've done videos about it, and we will have a link in the description of this video if you wanna check it out and possibly sign up and join. Yes, and I believe their rates are going up soon. So if you wanna join this year, join now and get the lower price. So that's privately owned land and private RV parks. Then there are the public RV parks. I'm thinking of national parks, state parks, city parks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes cities may have land set aside for RV campers. Mm -hmm. That's not even necessarily a park. It's, it's also places like Corps of Engineer campgrounds, that sort of thing. And finally, Bureau of Land Management land. Yes. And this is where you might boondock. Mm -hmm. And those can be some of the best, most beautiful campsites. Yeah. Price doesn't always guarantee you a great, beautiful campsite. No. Some of the best camping we've ever done has been quote unquote free mm -hmm. in boondocking land with no hookups. And some of the least scenic camping we've done has been some of the most expensive because if you're in a part <laughs> of the country, in an urban environment, you might be paying a lot of money for a campsite just to have hookups and it may not be scenic at all. So that's something to think about when you're booking your site. And some of the resources that we're going to give you to find sites also offer reviews where other campers have written a review of their stay. And those can be really valuable resources because the people that are staying there are usually going to tell you their best experiences and their absolute worst experiences. So you're going to get sort of the gamut when it comes to the reviews. And you can really weed through those and see if this is a park that's really worth staying at or if it's someplace that you need to keep on driving. To me, I really trust those reviews because it's people's personal experiences and you're not getting the the fancy glossed over photos from the campground website, you know, because you can make anything look good with the right camera angle and the right lighting. Take my face, for example. <laughs> but it's those pictures that people post that they've taken themselves of their own site that will show you, you know, oh, those sites are so tight, or you really don't have a view of the water. You've got a view of, uh, you know, swamp or something <laughs> instead of the, the scenic water view that they show in the one picture on their website. So some resources that we use when we're trying to find campsites. Typically, these days are apps and or websites. Yes. Most of these are 
available on our website as well if you don't want to use an app, but some of them are app only. The thing I like about a lot of the apps, if you're using it while you're on the road, it will find where you are currently if you're looking for a campsite in the area that you're already in. So that's for people like us that don't plan in advance and we just want to find something close to where we are at the moment. That's very helpful. If you're a planner and advanced kind of person, then that feature won't really matter to you. Let's sort of go through the, the apps and websites that we currently use and we'll tell you what kind of campgrounds are good for, for finding and if the app is better or if the website is better or it doesn't really matter. So first up on this list is there is a new national park app that you can download. This is very new. I think they just released it maybe a month ago. Previously, certain national parks had their own app that you could download, like Grand Teton National Park had one, Yellowstone had one, but there are a lot of smaller national parks that didn't have an app. So now every park or monument that's in the national park system is included in this app. So it's really, really nice. But this is an app only feature as far as everything being combined into one spot. But through that app, you can see all the campgrounds in each national park and what their you know specifications are. It'll tell you how long the campsite length limit is, you know, as far as how long your RV can be for each campground. It'll tell you what kind of hookups they have. It'll tell you if they have restrooms. It'll tell you what the price is, all those details and then there will be a link that you can click to make your reservation from the app. So it's kind of an all-in-one location to find those campgrounds or RV camping options within the national parks. And we will point out one huge change this year. There are some campgrounds in the national parks that are going to reserve only status. We're thinking, for example, of Grovant Campground in Grand Teton National Park, which is the largest campground in the national park system. For many, many years, you could pull up there at any time and pretty much be guaranteed of getting a campsite because it was so large, so they never really needed to have reservations. This year, they're making the change where you have to have a reservation in advance to yeah. get a site there. So that's going to be, frankly, a problem for us. I don't yeah. know if we're going to get in this year or not. Right now, they're opening the campground or reservation system um, six months in advance of whenever you want to camp there. So we usually stay there in mid to late September, so we wouldn't be able to make our reservation for that time frame until, I believe, April. Look at the calendar, see when you think you might be wanting to stay there, and then count back six months, and that is your window of time to book your site. Yeah, I'm really disappointed that they've gone to reservations, but last year they were so overwhelmed with campers, so many people showing up. I think because of COVID, you know, that had never camped before and they're just arriving in droves and they were just super overwhelmed. So I understand. Thank you, Christy. That's right. Hello, uh, loyal blog watchers and readers. We are here in Grand Teton National Park. We found a great campsite. Yeah, you know, we have been doing the Long Long Honeymoon Channel for almost 15 years now. I mean, the channel was created in 2006, so we've seen many changes happen over the years, and we've never seen a busier year than this most recent year. Yeah. So the RV industry has never been more popular yeah. than it is right now. RV sales have been booming, but not only that, you've got a lot of people that I think were just sort of once or twice, maybe three times a year going to like a local campground that all of a sudden were hitching up and heading out on these two and three month trips. And so it really just overwhelmed a lot of the, the really popular national park areas. And you've also got people working remotely more than yeah. ever now. And kids people. doing school remotely. So it's just opened up a lot of opportunities for travel for people that previously didn't have it. All right. One other resource that you need to know about is recreation.gov, the website. Yeah. They also have an app that you can use too. What can you find at recreation.gov? You can find like national forest campgrounds. Some of the national park campgrounds are there as well. Any sort of like kind of off the beaten path little campground that only has 10 sites or something that's part of a forest or what have you. Also, a lot of the Corps of Engineer campgrounds are listed on there. So it's just sort of a hodgepodge of government owned campgrounds. I am looking at a campsite for this evening at a Corps of Engineer Park. Um, this is on recreation.gov and this is a picture of the campsite that we are thinking of booking. So this is a water and electric hookup site and it's $22 plus tax. 
Lakes. Nice. And it's on that lake. So you can actually find the campgrounds and you can book reservations at recreation.gov. Yes. And that's becoming more important these days since the pandemic uh, because of social distancing. It's kind of a socially distanced way to check in to yeah. the campsite. Like a lot of times in some of these Corps of Engineers parks, for example, we noticed you could pull up and basically produce the proof on your phone mm -hmm. that you had booked a reservation and you didn't have to like go into a building and sign any paperwork or anything like that. It was right. all done online. Yeah, and one thing actually that we noticed this past year due to COVID that we actually liked was previously a lot of Corps of Engineer parks or parks that used recreation.gov for their reservations it used to be you had to make the reservation at least a day in advance. You could not make same day reservations. Well now because of COVID and they don't want people coming in, you can actually make same day reservations at a lot of locations through recreation gov so that is super helpful for somebody like us that you know we want to roll up to a Corps of engineer park same day and already have a spot then recreation.gov is the way to do it now what about state and city parks state and city parks i tend to find more through an app called rv parky rv parky has national parks on there they have the privately owned campgrounds but they do have the city and state parks as well they also have the corps of engineer parks and i really like their app because it's really easy to use as far as finding uh, campgrounds within a certain area you can have it where it will find where you are currently located and search within an area, you know, radius from where you are. But you can also sort of navigate around on the map to different areas. Like, say, if we wanted to go to Savannah, Georgia, you can just scroll over on the map to the Savannah, Georgia area and zoom in. And then it's going to show you all of your camping options in that area. So it's going to show you state parks, city parks, privately owned campgrounds, Corps of Engineer, and it will show you sometimes like overnight parking options like Walmart or Cracker Barrel, those sorts of places. And I will point out, we carry a Garmin RV Navigator GPS, and one of the best aspects of having that RV GPS are there are a lot of RV camping destinations built into it. For example, if we're looking for an Army Corps of Engineers park, uh, they will be highlighted on the map of our RV GPS. So that's something okay. to consider. If you're taking a long RV trip, you may want to invest in an RV GPS system. And I will say about the RV Parky app, to me, it's one of the easiest ways to find Walmart overnight parking because they specifically highlight Walmart with the little Walmart logo. <laughs> they also show Cabela's and Cracker Barrel. So it's just an easy way to find them. And it will tell you specifically if that... Um, Walmart allows overnight parking or not. So you can sort of save your time with locations that they know for sure don't allow overnight parking. The other thing about it that I like is it shows the Corps of Engineer parks very easily. You can find the Corps of Engineer parks on other websites, but man, it is really clunky. And so to me, RV Parky is the, the easiest way to find Corps of Engineer campgrounds. So what about boondocking sites like Bureau of Land Management land. And I'm thinking, for example, uh, last year we had a wonderful experience in the Alabama Hills area in California. There are a lot of different places that you can look to find great boondocking sites. We like to start with Campendium, which is both an app and a website. Now, weren't they developing the app for Android? Yes, there is an app that is dedicated for you Apple users out there. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you can easily download the app for Campendium. If you're an Android user like us, we have Samsung phones, so we can't use that app. So I just have a shortcut button on my screen of my phone that takes me to the Campendium website. It works just fine using it from my phone. There's no problem. It specifically is more you type in a location where you want to go. So you need to know a city name or a national park name or a zip code that you're wanting to visit in order to find the camping around that area. It's not just a map where you can scroll in and, and find 
places. You can do that once you find a location and move the map around from there, but the starting point, you have to type in a location. Once you type in a location area that you're wanting to camp in, there will be a map that pops up and then you can scroll around on the map from there, but it's not just a map to begin with. So that to me makes it a little clunkier than I would like for it to be. I'd rather it just be a map that I can zoom in on from from first entering it. But once you do put in a destination, you can scroll around on the map. And that I find to be more helpful than just typing in a destination. And the reviews in Campendium are really helpful yes. too. And for example, people will even point out how strong the cellular coverage was in a certain area. Yeah. And they'll usually post pictures of their campsite. They'll tell you how level the sites were. All the little details that you kind of need to know, most people will leave in their reviews on Campendium. So it's very helpful. Moving on, we'll talk about a couple of clubs. Uh, for example, Good Sam Club mm -hmm. and Passport America. Mm -hmm. First of all, Good Sam Club I believe the membership costs around 25 bucks ish mm -hmm. It changes a little bit from year to year. What do you get for that money? Well, you get a discount at Camping World stores, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is 10% or something like yeah. that. And you also get a discount at these different Good Sam parks. Mm -hmm. And so Good Sam is kind of like... Uh, an affiliate network type of thing. Like, in other words, they're all networked together. There's not some central Good Sam organization that is... That runs campgrounds. That runs campgrounds. Yeah. Right. It's not like KOA. Good Sam Club campgrounds are usually those mom and pop campgrounds that are individually owned that have just joined as a Good Sam affiliate. And they will give you that discount when you show your Good Sam card. So, I mean, you might ask, is it worth it to join? I guess it depends on how much camping you plan on doing at Good Sam Club parks. Yeah. We tend to do enough. I think usually if you're staying seven nights within a calendar year at a Good Sam Park, it pays for your membership. Bundle that with the discount that you get at Camping World and it makes it work. Yeah, and a lot of times we found the Good Sam affiliated parks are pretty friendly, family-owned places, and they typically have full hookups. Yeah, they're usually pretty clean, and Good Sam does have reviews as well on campgrounds, so you can go in and read people's reviews. I don't think it allows you to post photos of your site, so you won't get that aspect, but you'll definitely get details from people where they say, hey, this campground was kind of sketchy, or this one was really nice. But I don't think Good Sam has an app. It's pretty much website-based. I will point out that a lot of these campgrounds we've noticed that have a good Sam discount will also maybe give you a discount if you're a AAA member. Yeah. So if you have AAA roadside assistance or a AAA member, then you may be able to get the same discount without joining Good Sam Club. Now, Passport America is pretty interesting because Passport America is a club you join that offers, I believe, a 50% discount. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should be affiliates for Passport America. I'm not sure that we are right now, but we should be. Now, and there are certain parts of the country at certain times of year where this can be a great club to join. Yes. If you're traveling during peak season, then it won't be worth it because most of the campgrounds affiliated with Passport America don't offer the discounts during the high season. If you're traveling during the shoulder season, then it's great. We did it two years ago when we went to the Florida Keys in April slash May, and we stayed at numerous full hookup campgrounds for half price. So we were paying less than $20 a night in many cases, to stay at full hookup campgrounds full hookup places. in the state of Florida because we were traveling during off-peak season. Now, several of these campgrounds you'll get to, and it will be campgrounds where most of the people live there full-time, like retire retirement people that are there year-round or they're there for the winter or what have you. So it's not going to be like a typical RV resort type situation. It's more of a full hookup, clean place to park overnight. So I wouldn't go there expecting to spend my whole vacation there usually, but a lot of them are great for stopovers. When you want full hookups, you need to empty your tanks, you want to take a long hot shower, it's a good option. Yeah, that's an interesting observation just about RV parks in general. There's absolutely no consistency from one to the next. I mean, you, you can view that as, as a positive or a negative, however you want to look at it. Like mm -hmm. some are lush, RV resorts yeah. and others, you're just parking in a field, you know, <laughs> with nothing like no trees. It's just barren, no vegetation. Yeah. You know, we've seen the gamut. 
you don't really know unless you do a little bit of homework beforehand. Because I could imagine if you're new to RV travel, you might show up at one of these places where you're just parking in a muddy field and think, what the heck is this? What did I sign up for? There are other places that could be like trailer parks. You know, yeah. I mean, like the traditional trailer park where maybe 90% of the park are full time, like right. residents, and the trailers yeah. haven't moved in 30 years. Right. Now, that's a, an exception to the rule, but yeah. the, the point being, you may show up expecting a campground, and it's really more of a trailer park, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a difference. And a lot of these campground review sites or apps where people can leave reviews will give you that information. They'll say, 80% of the people here are here full-time. But they can also say, you know, it's very well kept. It looks like a resort. I wouldn't be concerned. And then there will be other locations where they're like, wow, I felt like I needed a police escort to get out of there, you know, <laughs> like and skip this place. So that's where it's really helpful to look at reviews when you're considering those individually owned campgrounds. To be fair, we stayed in some really nice quote unquote trailer parks that were maybe yeah. mostly full time. And I'm thinking like Hollywood RV Park. Yeah. There are a lot of people who are living there full time and it is a it's just a really great place. Great neighborhood feel to it. Very well right. run with really fantastic neighbors who you really want to meet and hang out with and talk to and get to know. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to do some homework to find out what to expect. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Harvest Host. Now, Harvest Host is a club that you join. You pay a flat fee, and then when you show up to the Harvest Host location, you don't pay any fee to the location. Now, the location is typically a place of business. Could be a winery. Could be a brewery. It could be a museum. It could be a farm, yeah. and typically there will be some kind of shop or store or some form of business at the location, and you're kind of expected to give something back in terms of patronizing that store. You know, it's a rough job that you might have to go in and buy a bottle or two of wine at a winery or drink some beer, but I'm yeah. willing to make those kind of sacrifices <laughs> for this Harvest Host experiences. <laughs> Overall, we've had very good experiences with Harvest Host so far, yeah. and the feedback we've gotten from most of our viewers has echoed that. Most people have had really good experiences. Yeah. I would say if you're in extreme temperature environments, like if you're in the south in the middle of summer, yeah then the harvest host might not be so attractive because a lot of them, you're not going to have any kind of electrical connection or hookup. Right. And some of them don't want you running a generator overnight. So it might be just a little bit warm. Yeah. You know, for But that's you. something that usually you can find in the notes. If you use the Harvest Host app, which is really easy to use, it's, again, a map that you can kind of zoom in on an area. It'll show you the options near you or in any part of the country. You can, you know, scroll around on the map. But once you click a location, there'll be some details about what the, the area is like, like how many RV spots they have, what's the max length of RV that they can park, because some of them do limit. Like they can only have a 25 foot, you know, space. So we wouldn't fit there because when we're hitched to our trailer, we're 45 feet long, you know. So things like that that you can look up in the app that's very helpful. It'll have how you contact them to set up your your stay, how much notice they want. Some places want seven days notice, and then most of them want same day or 24 hours, what have you. So you'll find all that information in the app. You can also find it on the website too, but if you're driving down the road, you probably don't have your laptop open to look at those sort of things. So it's super easy to access on your phone. The other thing that you'll see on the app are the reviews. So you'll see other people that have stayed there. They'll sort of give you details about this was a great stop or the people weren't very friendly, I would skip this one. You know, you'll get some some insight as to what to expect before you get there. I'll talk briefly about KOAs yeah. <laughs> because KOA, I believe, has a membership as well. Mm -hmm. Does it not that you can join? KOAs are the campgrounds that are sort of bright yellow and everybody's wearing a yellow shirt. <laughs> you know, the thing about a KOA, okay, for those of you who are seeking 
pristine wilderness and raw boondocking off-roading experiences are probably not going to want to stop at a KOA. But those of you who maybe have kids and want to find a swimming pool. And, and a playground. And a playground. And or a, a dog run hookup, for your dog. Or a pancake breakfast. That's right. You know, you can find that sort of experience at a KOA. Right. So, like, if you're a family traveling in an RV, KOA could be a great stop. Yes. KOAs are always going to have full hookup options available. They will have some sites that will be water and electric only, but you definitely will have the option for a full hookup. They do have an app as well that you can use. Um, again, it's just sort of a variation of their website where you can go and find find the KOA closest to you or the closest to the destination you're looking to find and you'll find all the details as far as what kind of electrical hookups they have if they've got 30 amp or 50 amp or you know do they have a swimming pool do they have a dog run all those sorts of things will be listed um, so you can sort of find the exact kind of site that you're looking for you don't have to be a member of KOA to use their app if you're somebody that doesn't want to join the KOA discount club you can still find them on their website or the app without being a member. You know, there's some other campgrounds out there that I'd like to mention just because they're very interesting to me, and that's like the Yogi Bear themed campgrounds. There are a few of them and, and they're sort of like family oriented resorts. I would say they're sort of Disney inspired because like Yogi shows up in the morning. And yeah, you can go wake Yogi up in his little, you know, cave. <laughs> but some of these have really elaborate water parks yes. on the property. And I think it's kind of brilliant for families with young kids, you know, as far as just having a destination. I mean, the kid is going to think like they're at Disney World or some fun place like that, <laughs> yeah. you know. Lots of activities at a lot of those Yogi Bear parks. So if you have young kids and you want something to occupy their time, those are good options for sure. And lastly, Reserve America is probably the, the last app that I sometimes use. It's probably my, my least favorite of the ones I've talked about today, but it is another option that you can use. Sometimes you actually will end up using Reserve America, whether you want to or not, because when you find a campground, like a lot of Corps Cor of Engineer parks or some state parks, will actually use Reserve America for the payment process and for the reservation process. So you might find like, for instance, Grayton Beach State Park in Florida, you might find that through another resource. And then when it's time to actually book your site and pay, it will take you to ReserveAmerica.com to actually make that reservation and payment. So there you have it, guys. At least 5,000 different techniques that we use. <laughs> It's really kind of tough because when you think about it with RV travel, there is an incredible number of different ways that you can camp, different places you can overnight park, mm -hmm. you know, everything from boondocking in the wild to <laughs> stopping at a Walmart parking lot and everything in between. And we haven't even mentioned one of our favorite camping destinations, our friends' driveways. Right. You know, Unfortunately, we, we can't share with you how to find yeah, them. We don't have an app for that. <laughs> but there are just a lot of different places you can camp, and it's, it's a little bit disjointed. So what we found works over the years is to have our go-to resources, mm -hmm. and we will often maybe check more than one. Yeah. So we invite you to share with us your favorite resources. I'm sure there are a number of apps that we have not mentioned here. Right. Uh, but hopefully you'll tell us about those in the comments. We'll check them out. Maybe we'll do future videos about those resources. Yeah, it can actually be kind of overwhelming the number of places that you have to go look or that you can go look to find a campsite. So again, just sort of cross-reference between a couple of different ones to make sure you're not missing a good site. And more than likely, you'll find what you're looking for. You know, believe it or not, we have embarked on multi-month journeys late at night before. We've left before at 9 p.m. <laughs> and in years past, we haven't been big planners and we've been able to do that knowing we could stop at a rest area or Walmart parking lot or, or places like that. But with more and more people hitting the road mm -hmm. and with things changing, I think planning in advance is becoming more important, mm -hmm. unfortunately. It makes sense to have a lot of these resources at the ready yeah. and to do some homework before you go someplace. Yeah, and actually I think us having a Harvest Host membership this last year came in really handy because we sort of knew in the back of our minds if we get to a general area and we're having trouble finding a campground for the night that there's sort of a Harvest Host backup in a lot of places. Now you're not going to have that everywhere nationwide but you do sort of you know 
have a good number in certain parts of the country that you can go to. Even Harvest Host these days, you know, a lot of these host locations will only have a handful of sites right. available on the property. And as more and more people get out there and RV travel, they're going to get snatched up faster. That's right. So just something we're all going to have to deal with. Yeah, it's, ca it's taking some of the spontaneity away, which makes me sad. But, you know, maybe in another year or so we won't have this problem once the world reopens. And I do think there are more resources opening up. And we'll talk about those in the future of where you can camp on people's private land, you know, because people are, are kind of doing the Airbnb thing with yeah. their land and allowing people to RV camp on the land. Right. which would be kind of, it's kind of like a version of Harvest Hosts, but for private land, which I yeah. think could be really interesting. Yeah. You know, I would love to see that catch on. So hopefully the industry will grow and we'll have more places to camp mm -hmm. moving forward. You know, I'd like to see more campgrounds in national parks in some of these different areas. Because yeah. we've talked about, you know, like Yellowstone, for example, there's a lot of land and there are places they could expand that would not negatively impact the environment yeah. that would provide just more and better camping opportunities. Yeah. Sorry guys, as always, thanks for tuning in. We hope you found this video helpful. This has been yet another episode of Long Long Honeymoon, the yeah. long longest running RV channel on the interwebs. That's right. And if you haven't joined Harvest Host and you're interested, click the link below this video. That is our affiliate link. So we do earn a little commission with that. If you join that way, we would appreciate it. Uh, otherwise, you can shop our Amazon store to support this channel at amazon.com slash shop slash long, long honeymoon. That link is also in the description bar below. Most importantly, if you're looking for a Hutzler 571 banana slicer, yeah. we'll have those featured prominently in our Amazon store. That's right. You don't want to miss out on that. Because we are bananas about RV camping. <laughs> All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with your friends and family. Again, leave a comment down below about your favorite way to find a campsite. And until next time, what do we say? We say, hello, hello, hello. Thanks, guys. See you next time. <laughs>